All right, guys, this week we have got Christian Salem. He is a Brighton Grammar boy, uh, played with him at the Sandy Dragons. He got drafted pick number nine in the 2013 draft to the Melbourne Demons, and he recently notched his 100 games. So congratulations on that, mate. Uh, Salem, could you give us a hello game day? Hello game day. Lovely. Now, Moosey is going to start us off with the stitch-ups this week. I certainly am, and I'm wrapped to have you on the show, brother. Um, and I, one of the things I love about you watching you play footy is that you're a real competitive beast on the field. You're, you love your tackling, you love the physical stuff, but apparently you were also very competitive in Monopoly and Scattergory games when you were younger, or maybe you still are. Yeah, I don't know where you got that from, but yes, I am. Um, it's... Uh... I've sort of been known of getting being called a cheat a number of times, but um, when you win so much, I guess that's what comes with it. Um, but yes, I am very competitive when it comes to that stuff. Is it true that you didn't speak to one of your boys, one of your friends, Naven, for two months in 2014 because he traded Mayfair to you? <laughs> <Instead of you? laughs> yeah, that's fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I've had some big blues over Monopoly, I'll tell you that, and a few other card games, but um, yeah. Surprisingly, we haven't really had too many blues lately. Um, but yeah, back in school, Jesus, man, there were some, there were some tough times. I actually don't think you ever grow out of that. Like when you when you play Monopoly, I just don't think you ever grow out of the competitiveness of it. It's just. Every yeah, I, think, I think the older you get, the more competitive you are when it comes to that stuff. Even though how childish those games are, but um, yeah, it definitely brings out the best in you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, apparently you had the master key to your school when you were younger. <laughs> And you used to sneak in and use the soccer pitch. Uh, is, how did you get the master key? Like, who, who did you butter up to, to get that? I did speak to um, uh, a head sports guy. Uh, he was similar age to my older brother and they went to school together or they knew each other. And um, I sort of came pretty good friends with him through that. And uh, one day I sort of asked for the key. I was sort of a bit demanding. I said I had to do some stuff in there and I wanted to do a bit of extra training and whatnot. And, um, I actually had it for about a couple of weeks and I teed up a 11 on 11 match on a Saturday. Um, and he sort of found out about that cause it was obviously private property and um, he did crack the shits at me and um, demanded it back on that day. He came and checked my pockets at, actually on that Monday morning. Um, and I had it under my shoe um, cause I was planning on cutting that key. <laughs> um, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually get round to it, but um, yeah, I sort of burnt that bridge pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, you have your luxuries at school. Obviously, one of them is having the master key. Another one's getting out of Bizman sacked because you had to get strapped up for footy training. Whereas a mate of yours was seriously ill and missed the sack and had to get a doctor certificate. Yeah, that is true. I um, worked for me the first two times, and then um, actually had this substitute teacher um, who wasn't a fan of me. And um, uh, that day, I sort of didn't rock up for my, I think it was my third or fourth sack. I didn't rock up because I said I was getting strapped, but I was actually trying to study in the library because the class before me had the same sack and um, he's walked in there and uh, caught me red-handed and, uh, geez, he went off at me. <laughs> uh, now, staying on the school note here. <laughs> but Nav must have given you some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is you 30 minutes before a year 12 exam. Can you <laughs> have, I got, have I got the right one up, the photo of you on the desk? You can confirm yeah, it was yeah. told that it was 30 minutes before your Bizman exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I was, uh, it was the last one of the year, I think, Rich, wasn't it? And uh, I think we were planning our night out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's impeccable. Clearly, we're not taking it too seriously. <laughs> that's brilliant. I don't know. How did you go in the exam? Uh... I sat there for two hours, got it, got it, finished it. Um, <laughs> didn't do too well, not as well as I would have liked, but it is what it is. Well, I'm surprised by that, mate, because you've there are occasions where you've done exceptionally well, particularly this one where you've got <laughs> one, out of 461. Can we, <laughs> that was an amazing effort. <laughs> that was uh, what year was that? I would have been year seven, I reckon. I um, I had a bad habit of. No, that was, sorry, that was like year five, I think. Yeah, I was uh, I had a bad habit of changing notes from the teachers and um, you probably might have this. I don't know if you do, but um, 
actually, I was year three. I, the teacher wrote me a note about like a staying back at lunchtime and throwing stuff or whatever. And I've tried to scribble out a note to my parents um, in pencil. Um, and then the next day they've come in, they've erased it, obviously, and they've wrote another note. And I've tried to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, that wasn't my best moment. So just for context, for those who are just listening, for this, you, there's a photo here. And I think, I think in reality, you've gotten, what does it say, 10 out of 46. So you've had to repeat it at next Wednesday at one o'clock. But you've written down you that you've got 440 out of 461 out of a few digits. Not bad. Not a bad decision. How you thought that would get rid of the keeper? I don't know. It's got to be one of the longest tests you would have ever <laughs> sat. So that's a little bit. And I'm seeing above, it says meeting in room two or three for debating. Were you a debater? Uh, I was doing that. You know the knocks? How they do the knocks? Yeah. Um, I went as like the team knocker just to um, get me out of a few subjects. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, I didn't really speak at all, to be honest. Now, uh, going on from being crafty, uh, there was another time you used a bit of craft in uh, making a bit of profit on your year 12 footy uh, end of season party by charging entry at the door. So what's the story with that? <laughs> I, um, I always said um, when we got the year 12 out of the party at my house and, I did. I um, I think I made about just under a K. Um, I was obviously all the boys got in and whatever, and um, I thought at the start we're probably gonna have a couple hundred people, and um, I think word got around pretty quickly that it was gonna get pretty big. So I thought, you know what, I might as well start charging some people. Um, I was charging a few of the boys' girlfriends, which probably looking back that wasn't great, <laughs> but uh, ten bucks a pop back then was good. Um, I had one guy came, he was a couple of years below me. Um, they came probably two hours into the night. I was just like, oh, what's the go? Can we come in? I'm like, look, I, it, was, wasn't, it wasn't full by all means, but I said, come back in about 20, 30 minutes. I'll see what I could do. You might have to pay. They're like, yeah, I'm happy to pay. Like, just let me know the price. Message him in 15 minutes. I'm like, look, man, it's, um, it's pretty busy in here. Um, if you guys have 50, 50 each or 25 each, um, that should work. Um, there was three of them ended up getting 75 from them. Um, they got in there, they're just like, fuck, what the fuck? Because it was uh, pretty empty, but um, no refunds. This <laughs> man, uh, Mark, when you've got those sort of entrepreneurial skills. Yeah. Man, that's very crafty. I feel like that's probably better than what you did in this scenario. So apparently in year eight, uh, you said that your cello fell in the pool so you couldn't <laughs> practice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, um, this is bringing back some good memories. Um, yeah, that I used that a few times. Um, didn't work at all, and I stayed back. A bit. I was going to say, surely no teacher was actually buying that. Yeah, I got away with a few things, but that was a bit of a stretch, I recommend. Oh, it's classic. Um, another one is that you lost a bet for a Snickers bar, and you made your mother come all the way down to the library, hand deliver it, so you could pay off your bet. No, <laughs> that's, that's, true? <laughs> that, that, that's a bullshit one. I, um, I've been stitched up a bit saying um, my mum would drop in things for bets or my lunch or whatever, but that's, uh, there's a lot of mail on those stories. Well, the next one was that she hand delivers your lunch from Rock yeah, Salt every there day. There you go. Yeah, I'm ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, that's, you got to uh, say. That's a stitch up. Maybe once in the four years and um, they've just <laughs> held that with me for a long time. Oh, and, and another one is, um, so apparently... I think James, your brother, and Mark is your best mate who attended the draft with you in 2013. They've prank called you pretending to be a, journal, a journalist or a recruiter uh, and you fell for it. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, who are they pretending to be? Yeah, I can't remember. They, um, uh, I think it was uh, someone from a radio station or something getting ready for an interview or some shit. And um, they called me. They had me on the phone for a good minute and a half. I had no idea. Um, and they start pissing themselves and they hang up. I'm like, what the fuck? like, what's going on here? I get a call from my brother who's obviously stitching me up. This was morning of the draft. So I was already like nervous as it was. Um, but uh, yeah, they did get me good. That's classic. And the last one, which not, not so much a stitch up, but uh, ever since I've known you, you've had this nickname. And what's the nickname behind uh, Gyps or Gypsy? <laughs> um, there's not much to it. There's this is like a serious mayor story. If you ask Hunty, Jaden Hunt, 
he says, "I've it's obvious Gypsy <laughs> Ham." So um, this is how yeah. this is what we got up to in year six. We we're talking about Gypsy Ham because um, I used to have my cheese and ham sandwiches. We spoke about, and there's a type of ham obviously called Gypsy Ham, and they didn't believe me. And Hunty's run with the story that I've brought a wheelbarrow of Gypsy Ham to school, which was a lie. I brought a kilo <laughs> from the shops with a tag. <laughs> Um, just to prove it to them, but um, the story to this day, Jaden says I brought a, a wheelbarrow. I don't know how I could get that into the school, but like, do you know what I mean? It's a serious man. But I like I didn't believe it, but I did. I was like, this yeah. will be one of the best stories ever if it's true. Yeah. So no, yeah. just to totally believe it. Yeah, um, what, like, what is gypsy ham? Like, <laughs> what actually is? <laughs> There's that? nothing special with it. It's just a, it's just a type of ham. It's um. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's shit you get up to in your kids, I guess. It's stuck with me now. Uh, that's 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 however long later, they're still calling me that. So it uh, must have been a good oh. story. Yeah, that, that, that had me in stitches when I read that, the wheelbarrow. That, like, that absolutely did me in. So that's all the, that's all the stitch ups we've got. So we're moving to some, some more footy stuff now. Uh, in your juniors, uh, we first came across each other in 2010 when we were playing against each other in local footy and a bit of rep. And one story with the rep footy was, I remember we were playing at Danny Nong. It was like a nighttime game. And you got the, you took a mark in the pocket. I think we were comfortably in the lead and you were getting heckled from the boundary line. And you were right where Dom Sheed kicked that goal in the grand final. And you just go back, didn't, didn't look to pass off or anything, just slot it straight through the middle. And you just look to the crowd and silence everyone. And that was one of the moments for me where like, I knew you as a, a player and I was like, wow, that was like pretty incredible. And then, Another time was uh, when the, uh, the mighty East Brighton Vampires came up against you, uh, Hampton Rovers, in 2015. And we were undefeated all year. You boys made it to the grand final. And we were just ahead, I think, in the last quarter. And I remember the last 10 minutes, I'm sitting on the boundary line, nearly crying, cramping, couldn't play the rest of the game. And you've just turned it on and single-handedly won the game off your own boot. So these were a couple of experiences I've had just seeing you play through now, under 15s to under 18s. Well, those are the earlier experiences. Um, you go on and play as an underage for Vic Metro, and then you, you're a part of the AIS Academy through, um, through both years. And those are telltale signs of being drafted as an AFL player. What was, this, was there a specific moment that enforced that you were highly likely to become a professional footballer? Um, to be honest, I sort of got into footy through my brothers. Um, I've got two older brothers, and they obviously played footy, and they went through East... Sandy. Um, the other one went through Hampton Rovers and uh, I just spent my time watching them and uh, they did a lot of games at Old Brighton as well once they finished school. So that's where I spent most of my time and I was usually kicking around with them and I remember I was 11 or 12 and I used to love going to uh, pre-season training with them. So I'd train um, where they used to train? Um, St Kilda's ground in Moorabbin. Um, so I used to do a few sessions there with them and I used to love having a kick. So um, I wasn't really like I was, I was obviously into it, but um, probably from about twelve or thirteen, that's when I started taking it pretty seriously. Yeah, probably it probably makes it a lot easier once you start getting rep games in and you're playing against a higher yeah. level of people. You start to realise where you kind of sit. Um, and then, what was the build up like towards draft night? And which clubs had shown the most interest in you? And did you expect to go to the D's? Yeah, it was um, it was a pretty funny one to be honest because um, start of the year like you don't really know what's going to happen and um, I had a few injuries to start the year and then I sort of got back playing and I finished off the year pretty well and um, at that stage it was probably Collingwood or Melbourne. Um, I think Collingwood had pick 6, 10 and Collingwood had 9 um, and in between there was Brisbane um, and North and North are already going to take Luke McDonald as that father-son so um, before the draft was up on Gold Coast and I was sort of speaking to my manager and he was just like, if Collingwood don't take you at six, you'll probably be at Melbourne at nine. And look, to be honest, I didn't, didn't really care where I ended up. I just obviously wanted to get drafted on the night. But, um, you know, landing at Melbourne has been great. I've really enjoyed my time here. So, um, yeah, I was real privileged. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're probably wrapped to be able to stay in Melbourne with your family because you've got pretty strong ties with them. And uh, so you go to Melbourne and you inherit the jersey number three, which obviously has a bit of weight behind it at the Melbourne Football Club with Gary Lyon, uh, and no doubt a significant moment for you. How did uh, did he reach out to you and like did you receive any kind of you know advice or is there any sort of friendship you built after that moment? Um, I've met him once. I've seen him 
uh, it was a couple of weeks after we got drafted. We started preseason, and um, uh, they obviously don't have it anymore because it's not around. But the footy show used to have uh, the top ten, like a sort of like a jumper presentation sort of thing. Um, that was back when he was the host, and um, got to meet him then backstage and had a good chat about um, his days and um, how we went about it. So. Um, yeah, I've met him a couple of times, but um, haven't really been in too much contact with him um, nice. ever since then, to be honest. Nice. And moving forward to, you, you get a few games early, but it only took just your seventh game to be able to display your class as a first-year player. Uh, you marked the ball 35 metres out, kicking the clutch goal to steal a victory against the Bombers by one point in the final seconds of the game. Can you give us a retake on how you're feeling and the experience of that moment? Um, well, I spent three quarters sitting as a sub. The sub was back then, and um, yeah, it was like my sixth or seventh game, and I spent the first four games as a sub. So um, I was sitting there, and we're down by about 30 or 40 points or something, and I'm just like, fuck, it's going to be a long day getting on here, and the game's sort of done. But the boys fought back, and then, um, yeah, I actually went for Essendon growing up, so it was pretty surreal. Um, uh, and yeah, it was just good to get on the end of some good work, and um, yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if they said it in that, but or if the boys said it after the game. They're like, if anyone you want it in anyone's hands, they'd want it in yours. And I can definitely confirm that through playing with you. You just absolute silky left foot. So uh, moving forward to 2016. Now I read about this. I haven't actually personally heard any stories about this, but a bizarre incident occurs at the end of 2016 where you get concussed at a preseason camp. Uh, can you give us your turn of events on what happened? I don't remember much, but um. We, uh, we had this three-day, um, like, you know, those sort of boot camps that most clubs have. And um, it was a pretty long day. We were getting smashed right from the morning. And uh, it was probably about 3 a.m. Um, so after a long day of work, we are getting smashed. And we were hiking for about three or four hours. We had 15-kilo bags. Had to have a couple of bricks in it. Um, had to carry poles. So we are just marching in the middle of the night. We are sort of going um, down a hill and... I don't know why I packed my brick at the top of my bag. Um, but like I went to sort of adjust it and like it wasn't really adjusting. So I gave it one big one and it sort of smacked me in the back of the head. Um, and that's coming off two concussions that year. So it probably wasn't the greatest thing that happened to me. But um, yeah, I was, uh, I was lights out for a few seconds and um, <laughs> that was the end of my camp. So how far out from where you were to begin with? Like, was it a far walk back or did you get the stretcher out? Oh no, we were in the middle of the uh, middle of the woods. It was in uh, Mount Disappointment. Um, so it was three a.m. They sort of um, those sort of military guys. Uh, they, the first guy said, "Do you want some Nurofen?" I said, "Hey, I don't know what's going on here." And he was uh, trying to get me going again, and it wasn't really working. So I ended up staying that. I didn't sleep for that whole night because um, obviously with the concussion, you want to stay awake and whatnot. And um, I was cooked as it is from the work that we did during the day. So I think I ended up leaving there at about nine or 10 o'clock. One of the staff members had to get called and um, had to take like an hour or two drive home. So it wasn't ideal. Yeah, but, um, yeah shit happens. <laughs> well, at least Mount Disappointment lived up to its, <laughs> its name. Yeah. Um, in, in your first four seasons uh, between 2014 and 2017, you managed to put together 46 games uh, with injuries being like a major factor that limited you. Uh, what have you implemented since the start of 2018 to see you pretty much play every single game up until now? Yeah, I've, uh, yeah it's, those first sort of four or five years are pretty frustrating for me because I'll get a little run at it and then I had about four or five concussions. Um, probably even a bit more over that time and um, a few soft tissue injuries as well. I've done about three or four hamstrings. So um, the most frustrating thing was obviously like you do a hamstring, you know, your time length to come back from it. But with a concussion, it's so many different symptoms and, you know, you, you could run as much as you want, but like you're just feeling off. Um, I guess that was probably the frustrating thing for me. But um, I think it was the end of 2017. Um, we just missed out on finals and I was obviously pretty pissed um, because we blew a good chance. But um yeah, I just sort of knuckled down and um, got my shit together and um, had a pretty big uh, off-season. Um, just putting in work and that sort of held me in good stead. And, um, you know, to this day, of um, my body's held up pretty well and uh, touch wood. And, um, yeah, I've been able to string some games together. Yeah, it's awesome, mate. Obviously, the injury prevention and all the other stuff that you're implementing is definitely helping you out. Now, another one is with uh, Paul Ruse and Simon Goodwin. 
between them. What were the, are there any differences in their, their coaching styles and the way they went about things? Uh, yeah, Ruzi was, um, like they're both great coaches and um, everyone knows about Ruzi's history, but, um, you know, he was great. He sort of helped rebuild the club from the start. And um, when you sort of compare him, you sort of got that old school versus, um, you know, a modern day coach. And, um, you know, end of the day, they both have similar philosophies, um, you know, contest teams and, um, you know, high work rate. Um, is what you need to win and like they've both been successful Ruzi as a coach and um, obviously Goody as a player um, so yeah it's good to see like a little mix and I think that what helped us with that transition we actually had Goody as an assistant um, before he took over um, when Ruzi was in charge so um, he got to build a relationship with the players and um, it was a pretty smooth transition. Now I could only imagine that there'd be some almighty sprays that would have come from uh, Ross uh, sorry not Ross, Paul Ruse. <laughs> Uh, have you got any that come to mind, not, even if it's not aimed at you, but anyone else that you kind of witnessed along the way? Um, he's had a few. He, um, one day we're playing in uh, Alice Springs and um, we had about three or four options for kickouts. It's like short left, there's a short long one, um, or just sort of like get it in quickly. And um, we're down by, I think, eight or nine points. So in Port at that time, um, we're a very good team and we were probably only had a couple of wins to our name. I think it was in his first year and um, we've worked real hard to keep in the game and um, yeah, we're down by a goal, probably six minutes left. So there's plenty of time and um, Lyndon Dunn, who was at the club, is now at Collingwood. Uh, he's picked up the ball, kicked it to himself and tried to torp it straight down the middle like there was a minute left. Um, went, landed straight on a port guy's chest down the other end goal. Um, Ruzi came in uh, straight after the game and just beelined him. He just let him know. Um, he got straight in. It was one of the biggest sprays I've seen. Oh, wow. I can only imagine how Johnny would have reacted to that because he's an absolute character as well. Yeah, it was. <laughs> he, um, he was putting his hands up and I think he just copped it at that time. But uh, we still speak about it to this day because it was <laughs> the situation, the way he did it. And Ruzi sort of reenacted like a torpedo as he was walking towards him. Um, with his man, and it just it was a piss. I was, it's funny. Oh, that's terrible. Now, uh, towards the end of last year, you guys, Melbourne released the To Hell and Back documentary. Now, that was like a, a statement of intent for you guys to say that we're going to be the fittest, we're going to work the hardest, and come out and really make a difference. I want to get your take on the sort of philosophy behind that and what your take on, on that documentary was and what it meant to you. Uh, yeah, I, look, to be honest, I only watched a little bit of it. Um, we don't really, obviously, as players, um, I'm assuming most of them look into it, but, uh, you know, we can't control that. Um, that's sort of like a separate sort of thing, like the media team do what they need to do. And um, I guess it's more for inside of supporters, um, not only us, but other clubs, just to see um, behind the scenes what a club looks like, what they go through over the pre-season and whatnot. And um, to be honest, if I was a general fan, um, I would have found it enjoyable um, from what I've heard about it. And seen a little bit of it but um yeah it is what it is as players you can't look too much into it we have a job to do and that's obviously win games um and i guess all that stuff just comes with it it was definitely enjoyable it was pretty unusual to see that sort of insight into a, like a, a pre-season but you guys have some serious talent in the squad i mean from the ages of 20 to 25 i think you guys arguably have the best in the league in terms of that talent that could then take the next step and become a graders and build a premiership side if there are a few sort of key things that you guys think you could implement to realise that potential, what would those things be? Um, yeah, I guess a good question. I guess, um, you know, we are a very young list at this stage. And um, I guess when you look at the good teams and um, their best is obviously elite, but when they're not at their best, they're still at that sort of high level. Um, you know, they're still just winning by a goal or if they're losing, they're losing by a goal. Um, I guess for us in the past, if, you know, our best is elite, we could match it with the best, no problems. But um, when we drop off, our worst um, puts us right back to the middle of, middle of the table. And, um, you know, you sort of see on the weekend, for example, Brisbane, um, you know, they weren't at their best by any means, but they've kept St Kilda to 47 and they've kicked 50. So they've obviously their defence at the start of the game to the end of the game was elite. They obviously didn't have their scoring power, but they managed to get over the line. And, um, you know, I guess for us, it's minimising that gap between our best and our worst. Um, and it'll put us in a, you know, a better position, I guess.
Yeah, absolutely. Get that consistency going. And obviously, of the talented young guys that you have at the, at the club, who are the ones that have really turned the head for you? Um, yeah, Sam Wiedemann. Um, you know, he's a big boy and, you know, people say key, uh, key forwards need a lot of time to develop, but, you know, this preseason he's been massive and, um, you know, the work that he's put in, not only on field, but off field to get his body um, a lot stronger and competing for longer, he's, uh, I thought he's been great. And, um, you know, you see uh, Cozzy Pickett, uh, little 18 year old is coming in and um, he's doing some freaky stuff already. So, you know, we do have the talent. Um, you know, we just got to keep performing each week to a consistent level, um, you know, and results take care of itself. Definitely some exciting players there. Those two that you've mentioned would probably be the two that I'd single out as well. Um, I wanted to see how Maxi Gorn was going with the captaincy this year and if, if you could sort of think about the next wave of leadership, who would who would that look like? Um, yeah, he obviously got Gorney and this is his first year as um, sole captain and you know, he's done a great job. He's obviously different to Vines, um, you know, as you guys would know, um, personality-wise and, you know, how they approach the game. But, you know, they're both two terrific leaders and, you know, they're sort of two that we have at the moment. And um, we sort of got a whole young crop coming through. Like, there's um, Christian, like, Track, uh, Petrarca, Oliver, um, Gussie Brayshaw. Um, so, everyone, everyone, those guys that I mentioned, lead in their own way. Um, so it's an exciting spot to be at. So um, and Jake Lever as well um, in the defence. So yeah, we do have a lot of leaders through there. It's just you know we're all still pretty young, so it's just developing good habits and um, being consistent with it. It's interesting to hear from you because I've for a few years now, along with a lot of other people, really rated the squad that you guys are building and and what you guys have got going there. So I hope for your sake that it can really start to sort of we can see the fruits of that coming through now. On a less serious note, who would you say would be the biggest larrikins? Like, who never shuts up around the club? Uh, obviously, Petrarca. Um, me and Clary have spent... Uh, we actually spent off-season together. We went to Europe and America, and the three of us... Um, me and Clary, obviously, were thinking how we're going to do it with track for so long, but uh, we got through. So he was probably the biggest one at the club. Um, he's always taking the piss, but uh, who else is there? There's a few funny, low-key funny boys. Um, Jakey Melksham's pretty good um, with his chat. But, uh, yeah, we've got, obviously got a WhatsApp group, so there's a few things that float by. Yeah, right. And, you know, you're from a Lebanese background. I've, now, I was watching something from 2014 of you doing a dinner at your family's house on YouTube the other day. I'm sure you would have seen that. And you were... Yeah. Mum was making the tabbouleh and stuff. And it looked like one of the best feeds I've ever seen. I absolutely love Middle Eastern food. Um, what 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 is the culture sort of sort of mean to you, and how good are the feeds? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm missing it, man. I haven't been at home for nearly two months now, so I need some taboo in that. But uh, yeah, it's obviously important. Family is a big thing, as Richie touched on earlier to me, and um, uh, yeah, you know, obviously all being together, and um, you know, food's one thing, but obviously <laughs> spending a lot of time together is another thing, and um, you know, grateful to have them around and have the support, but. Uh, yeah, I'm due for a feed when I get back, I reckon. Absolutely, yeah. And another thing I noticed was that your old, you said that um, your old man loves to tell stories about what he used to get up to in Lebanon. Can you enlighten us <laughs> with any of those stories? Because I can imagine they'd be pretty cool. Well, yeah, I guess uh, when I used to have all my mates around, he, uh, I'm assuming you got that off now. But yeah, he used to just tell a lot of stories about back in his day, as all dads do. But um, yeah, he's had some pretty cool stories from um, his upbringing. He grew up in Lebanon. Um, until he was maybe 11 or 12, and then he moved to Cleveland uh, in America. Um, and he was working there till he was about 21. So he um, was working as a dishwasher, then a chef, um, and then ended up opening up a restaurant there when he was 21. So, um, you yeah, know, he, he has a few stories, and, um, you know, they're always entertaining. Yeah, I can imagine growing up in Lebanon as well would have been would have been a pretty, pretty uh, there'd be a lot of cool, cool stories coming out of that. Um, since you've been at the club at Melbourne, is there anyone that you could put your finger on, like whether it's a player or a coach or a staff member or someone that's been like a real mentor for you? That's particular. Um, yeah, obviously one that's been there the whole time um, was the midfield coach, Benny Matthews. Um, me and him have a pretty good relationship. He only lives around the corner from me um, this whole time. So... Um, you know, back when I was a bit younger, we regularly used to catch up, coffees, lunch, just have a chat about where my game's at, where the team's at. Um, 
you know, and just general stuff, just life off field stuff. And sometimes it's good just to have him around just to, you know, switch off, get away from footy and just um, talk a bit of shit. So um, he's one that I guess has been there through the whole journey with me. And uh, yeah, it's good to have that sort of relationship. Yeah, and I'll, that's a really good segue into my next question, actually. This is the last one I've got for you. I know Ponch has got one more after this, but um, do you, you, you're you obviously a, a stalwart down in defence for Melbourne now, but do you see yourself changing and going into the midfield at any point? Do you have an ambition to do that? Yeah, I guess, you know, obviously getting drafted as a midfielder, that's um, one thing you want to do. And, you know, speaking with the coaches, um, you know, at the moment, that you've got to do what the team needs and... Um, sort of putting my strengths on show at half back is, you know, we've got a lot of midfielders at the moment um, and sort of half back was something that um, we sort of needed a bit of work on. So I've been there since my second year now, second or third year. So, um, you know, I guess end of the day, I want to win, uh, win a premiership. So whatever I need to do to do that, I'll, uh, I'll do it. But yeah, I guess one day I'll uh, float through the midfield. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Now, I'll finish off with, um, obviously, you touched on going off with the truck and uh, Clayton Oliver to Europe and the off-season travels. Uh, I saw that you guys went to Nike headquarters as well. So, what did you boys get up to over there? Yeah, that was great. That was um, towards the end of our trip. Um, we uh, were sort of both with Nike. So, we sort of used, reached out a bit to see what we could do because we've heard um, a few boys in the past have been there. And um, we signed a new fitness coach, Darren Burgess. So... Um, we sort of used his connections as well, and we spent about a week there. Um, it was honestly, it was pretty mind blowing. Some of the shit that they got going on there is just unbelievable. So we spent um, the full week training every day, and um, we had different sort of trainers with us uh, for different aspects. Um, you know, day was spent with a dietitian and the strength coach. Had a running coach. Um, they took us. Um, and showed us sort of the technology that they have. Um, they did a few different scans of our body and different movement stuff. Um, and they sort of ranked it against athletes around the world. Um, reaction tests, whatnot. Um, it was just a pretty cool insight. It's um, crazy what they got going on there in terms of technology wise. And, you know, to be honest, we would have gone back at the end of this year, but obviously COVID and whatnot um, probably won't happen. Is there anything specific that you actually got out of it? Like, was there a specific like dietary thing or was there like a, a drill or anything that you kind of like took from that um, experience? Cause I know Took did something in, um, did something in LA and it was specific and he, he got some dietary requirements. Like they, they tested what he ate and, and saw what worked best for him. So was there anything like specific or different that you'd get from there that you've, you've never gotten before? Yeah. We spent a lot of time with this guy called Keith. He was, um, uh, I don't think he's doing it anymore. He's working at Boston Celtics for about four or five years and, um, he was sort of a movement coach. Um, and with my situation, I'm real tight around my hips and um, my glute and lower back and whatnot and um, just different exercises just to get that going. And I spent about 20 minutes with him before I did my running and um, we're doing some different weight exercises. And growing up, you probably wouldn't do weights before you run. And, um, you know, I backed him in and I just wanted to see how I felt. And um, you know, it felt amazing. So I do some of that stuff before each game now. And, um, yeah, it's just little things you pick up, man. Like it's Petrarca obviously done the same thing and he's picking up little things for his body. So, um, the best bit about it is really individualized. Um, so you just take what you needed and, uh, just added it to your game. Awesome, mate. And, and obviously another one is, uh, it's obviously a truck knows Ben Simmons over there. So what was the experience like being court side? I know you're a basketball fan. Um, and, did you, uh, were you keeping up with the Kardashians over there? Anything like that? <laughs> no, we, um, it was pretty funny how it worked out. We obviously caught up with him in Portland and, uh, like, oh, you know how many games there are and the chances that we're in Portland and Philly are playing in Portland as well as, uh, we're very lucky. So we, um, yeah, he sort of looked after us with tickets and then, um, they came back and won. They were 20 down and they came back and won on just before the buzzer. So, um, Lucky enough, we ended up going out for dinner with them and we sort of went out with them after that. And, um, yeah, it was a pretty enjoyable night. Details, please. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they, um, yeah, they, uh, they, they are fun. They were, uh, they were at uh, Dame Lillard's club, I think it was. And, uh, you know, they were flying out the next morning, so they didn't do nothing crazy. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely enjoyable. No Kardashians. They're good fellas. They're down to earth, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, we went out for dinner and we are just thinking, like, 
fuck, we'll just keep to ourselves, but they just treat you like one of them. Um, they, just, they just love talking shit. Um, so, yeah, they're a good bunch of guys, and, um, yeah, spewing, we can't head over there this year. Oh, mate, well, uh, it would have been an unreal experience, and that's all the questions we've got for you. We won't chew you off any nah, longer, but for, yeah. for me, mate, um, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming on, and I think just with yourself and a few of the other Dragons boys, it's just it's awesome to experience watching you guys go out there and play. Like, I guess I kind of live a little bit vicariously through you boys. So it is awesome. I like to watch you boys each week and have a bit of pride seeing you boys out there. So once again, thanks, mate, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Easy, boys. Talk soon.